Okay, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to follow up with this CAT D337F generator set. Now, a couple weeks ago, we got the engine running, and it seemed to run pretty well. But in this video, I want to take a look, closer look at the generator portion of this generator set. Uh, specifically, what we're going to need to get it operational, more or less. Now, in the last video, we, we talked about how the original exciter generator and some of the controls are missing from this unit. Now, a good friend of mine out in Indiana happens to have a Caterpillar exciter generator, but it's for a smaller generator set. It doesn't have the output power that this thing specifies. So what I want to do today is start this up, run it under load, actually put a load on the generator, and figure out what the actual requirements are for excitation for this unit. Now, the nameplate calls for 110 volts and 29 amps nominal. But what, is, what does it really mean? Can we get by with a smaller exciter, or is it just not going to work at all? So let's take a closer look at it. Okay, well, I've gone ahead and removed the uh, <clears throat> brush holder assemblies. So we got a left and a right here, and one is the field positive, one is the field negative. And you can see they're, they're made of, you know, they're welded steel construction and they are pretty rusty. The, uh, the springs themselves are actually stainless, I believe, or some, some uh, corrosion-resistant metal, so they didn't rust at all, which is nice. But the adjusters, sorry, the spring tension adjusters do not move at all, so that's all gonna have to be taken apart. Oh, that one actually does move. But I think I'm gonna take all these all apart and go ahead and glass beat them and uh, get ready to reassemble those. Uh, and I'll show you how these mount. It's pretty simple. You can see that this one, we have uh, some oil and grease leaking out of the rear bearing. And this brush at the bottom of this assembly is all greased up. So pretty much, let's go down here to the uh, generator end. And you can see a pin. Let me just zoom in on it right there. We got a pin right here. And a pin down here. And there's a, like a, a fiber sleeve that's uh, pushed over that pin just as an insulator. And you can see the steel pin here because the, the insulating sleeve slid right off of these pins. One hiding down there. And the, the slip rings are pretty well oxidized. They'll need a buffing, but that's not a big deal. But now that those are out of the way, we can get set up and uh, get ready to do our uh, insulation checks on the rotor and stator. Okay, for the insulation test, we're going to use this 500 volt uh, bridge mega. This is a combination mega ohm meter and Wheatstone bridge resistance meter. We're not going to worry about the Wheatstone bridge part of it right now, but we're going to use this device to determine if there's any leakage or the amount of leakage in the stator and rotor windings in the actual generator itself. So what this comprises is a, a 500 volt DC generator, it's hand crank, and then a couple output terminals and a scale that reads in mega ohms. So from 100,000 ohms right up to 1,000 mega ohms at infinity. So a complete open circuit. Now the reason we use tools like this and this is a 500 volt. I've got a thousand volt mega as well. But we're gonna, we're just gonna stick with the 500 volt mega, is because if it, it's it's a troubleshooting tool really, and a kind of a preventative maintenance tool to, to determine the condition of the insulation on these windings. You see, they don't they don't look in the best of shape, but they don't look burnt, and there's no copper exposed, at least from what I can see here. So we got the stator windings here. And then the rotor, we've got our, our field poles on the rotor. That all looks fine. I mean, they're, they're dirty, but they don't look, they're not completely packed with dirt. And they don't look particularly wet or damp. They don't feel wet or damp. And I don't see any exposed copper, so that's a plus. Now, when you use a mega, you have to be really cautious. One, because it's a fairly high voltage, something you wouldn't want to touch. 
and two, especially with a, a something like this, a motor or a generator, when it's disconnected like this, it's essentially a capacitor. It's two conductors separated by an insulating layer. So the one conductor would be ground in this case, and the other conductor would be the actual windings of the generator, and the insulation is the insulation of the conductors. So when you charge this, when you use the mega and you apply a voltage across the insulating layer by connecting one terminal to ground and one terminal to the conductor, you are charging this capacitor essentially to whatever voltage you're testing with. So when you are com completed with your testing, you've got to make sure that you discharge the capacitor in a sense by, by, by taking a lead and t touching it to ground and shorting it out. So just a little safety tip there. So, but we're pretty much ready to get started. Uh, one other thing I want to touch on before we do is I had a lot of questions in the last video regarding uh, what, what did I mean when I said this is not a reconnectable generator end. So let's talk about that real quick. All right, let's talk real briefly why this is a non-reconnectable generator end. So here's a, a, a diagram of how the windings in this unit are connected. So we've got our four wires are T1, T2, T3, and T0, or neutral. So in reality, there are six windings in this generator, but they're parallel. So there's two windings for T1 that are in parallel, two for T2, and two for T3. Now, in the center here where these all connect, these two points right here where you know the, the one set of three connect and the other set of three connect are made permanently in the stator winding in the generator. And then there also is a bridge between those two points. That is also made permanently in the stator. So it's really not serviceable. You could take the generator end apart, and I'm sure you could find that point, and if you were determined, you could separate them and then pull the ends of these windings out to the connections box where these are, and then you could have yourself a 12-wire generator end, and it could be reconnected. But for all intents and purposes, this unit right now is not reconnectable. It's serviceable for these two voltages, 12208, which is common here in the United States, and 139240, which is not very common. Essentially, all you're doing is increasing the excitation to boost to the 208 to 240 because the ratios between 12208 and 139240 are pretty much the same. So, enough of that. Let's start uh, doing some testing here. All right, let's get started with this insulation test finally. So I've got one lead of the uh, Mega uh, attached via some tape uh, to the one of the field rotor field slip rings. The other is again just taped onto the rotor shaft. So what we're checking now is the resistance or the insulation integrity of the rotor windings themselves. So let's come over here. Let me try to set you up on the stand. This might be a bit of an awkward shot, so bear with me here. And we'll take a look at the scale. Now, Caterpillar recommends a minimum of one megaohm of resistance per 1,000 volts of generator rating. So we're well under a thousand volts. Now, the the winding we're testing should normally never see greater than about 110 volts because that's the the uh, nominal field voltage. So we're going to test it at 500 volts just to verify that we don't have any path to ground. So is that scale fairly clear? Hopefully the sun's not washing it out too bad. So to start, I'm going to take a screwdriver and short out the output to the Mega and just turn the handle very slowly. Sweep that right to zero or dead short. I'm going to remove the screwdriver and the manual for the Mega calls for a test duration of between 30 seconds to a minute. So we're going to go on the 30 second mark. And we're also going to, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but 
there's a, a slip clutch built in to the Mega itself so that, you can, I don't know if you can hear this, I'm turning the, the unit slowly and you can hear the motor kind of spinning around. The idea you have to turn this crank, you see what I'm doing? You gotta turn this crank past the slipping point of the clutch to ensure that the, the Mega is making its rate at 500 volts to ensure that the generator inside here is turning at its correct speed. So let me zoom you back in and we'll start the test of the field windings. All right. So, looked like we were about six and a half, around six, six and a half mega ohms. So that's pretty good. We're well within the uh, recommended insulation spec. And what we'll do here, just to discharge any capacitance, we're just going to go ahead and short these. Not, not that, not that the uh, rotor was going to hold much, uh, much of a charge. So, all right, let's reset and we'll do the stick. All right, so we're all set up for the test of the stator windings. One lead of the Mega is going to just a random output lead of the generator. Now remember, these all go into the stator and get tied together, so they're essentially all the same winding for this test. And the other lead just goes to frame ground. So let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to start by start the same way and shorten out these two output terminals and just turn the handle slightly. Make sure we sweep to zero. And let's go ahead and get started here. So that was about 80 mega ohm. So definitely a very, very, very minimal leakage in the stator. So that's good. Good old, uh, good old Caterpillar made a reliable generator end or a durable generator end. So at this point, we're done with the insulation tests, and I feel confident that we can excite this thing and get it making uh, output voltage. So let's go ahead and get set up. All right, well, here's a quick look at the brush assemblies, the brush holders all cleaned up. Everything looks good. Brushes look good, We've got plenty of life left in them. A little bit of new hardware and put this back together. Okay, so we're ready to start our load testing. Load will be provided by these two load banks. They're good for about 70 kilowatts a piece at 208 volt. So we'll be able to get up to, you know, around 140 kilowatt, which is a, a little over 90% of the nameplate rating of the generator set. So I think that'll be enough to get an accurate idea of what the field requirements are. So I got those connected up here. I got a clamp on amp meter here. Give us our uh, load in amps and field field, I don't know where that came from, field control will be provided by 
this variac and we'll monitor it with these meters here. So we'll be monitoring amps DC and volts DC going into the field. This apparatus here is just powered off of one of the windings. So it's one of the windings to, to neutral. So we're at 120 volt nominal uh, feed to the variac. And the variac is a three kilowatt capacity. So pretty much we got variac, we got a rectifier bridge here, change that AC into DC, goes through the meters, and we got a knife switch here to just disconnect it from the generator. So the output here goes to the field, brushes, and then this is the input, that 120 volt circuit. So initially it might take a little bit of uh, fiddling with the uh, variac to get the voltage to build up, because remember we're going to be starting off with just residual magnetism. So I've adjusted the speed of the generator to a little over 61 hertz, which is about what the data plate calls for. I think the data plate calls for a no load speed of around 62 hertz, but it's at 61 and point something right now, so I think that's fine. But uh, yeah, it's already warmed up. So I'm gonna set, set you on the tripod over here, but I'll move you around a little bit as we start putting some load on it. I'm gonna go start it up and bring it up to operating speed. See, I got the stack on there now. Alrighty. Start her up.
bulbs at zero angles.
up is 120 kilowatt, that's 80 percent.
I said this already, I don't know why I'm saying it again, but this current is going to differ from the nameplate current. Even though we were at, we were at darn near 150 kilowatt, that current is going to differ from the nameplate current, mainly because the nameplate is, well, almost always at 0.8 power factor, 80% power factor, which since we're using these resistive load banks, we have a 100% power factor, or a power factor of 1. So we're using only 400 amps to do 150 kilowatts worth of work. But what's interesting is it looks like we're, we're just under the available replacement exciter, which is really interesting. So we can pull 400 amps out of this generator with 58 volts and 17 and a half amps of excitation power. That, that's pretty impressive. So really, with with the load like we had it with a with a resistive load, with no huge uh, inrush loads, we'll we'll be able to get by with that 2L1818 exciter. Now, of course, the reason Cat specs a much larger exciter is to is mainly for almost what I just stated. It's for transients. It's for high inrush loads. Situations where the unit needs to deliver a lot of current for a short amount of time. That's why they want so much extra field power. That's a good sound there. Yeah, everybody uh, enjoyed this video. Thought it was interesting. I sure had fun uh, making it and doing this work. It's good to know that the engine seems healthy. 
We had some droop in the in the uh, governor, but you're gonna have that on this old mechanical type. That's why the no load speed is listed at 1863 and the load speed's 1800. Droop is a factor of life or a part of life with these old uh, mechanical governors. Good to know the generator end is in good shape too.